Welcome to the Working Well Podcast. I'm Tim Boris, CEO of Fresh Wellness Group. This show explores the diverse aspects of workplace health and personal performance. On the Working Well Podcast, we dive into the foundations of what makes wellness work in workplaces around the world. We connect with corporate leaders, executives, and industry experts who are helping make life more awesome at work and home. Join us to learn workplace wellness best practices, personal performance tips, and access resources to jumpstart your personal and corporate programs. Meet Dr. Caroline Brookfield. She believes that if everyone took small, unconventional actions to embrace their inherent creativity, we could change the world. Caroline dances on the edge between art and science, thrilled to discover that we don't have to choose. As a veterinarian, researcher, and stand-up comedian, Caroline delights in using humor and immersive experiences backed up with research and data to sway the most reluctant creative. She is always up for a challenge, like learning guitar, rock climbing, getting her kids to eat vegetables, surfing, and meditation retreats with sniper rifles. You know, the usual stuff. Caroline received her veterinary degree from the Ontario Veterinary College, is a certified level two creative problem solving facilitator and holds a certificate of professional management from the University of Calgary, where she lives. Her lectures go unheeded by her family, but the dog listens sometimes. Caroline, so great to have you on the show. Welcome. Welcome to the Working Well podcast. Thank you so much, Tim. I'm excited to be here. Excellent. So today we're going to talk a lot about creativity and well, outside of traditional creative industries, maybe art and design or something like that, people rarely think about creativity when they talk about jobs in the corporate world. Talk, talk a bit more about that. Like, how did you get into corporate creativity? Yeah, um, I think a lot of people consider creativity something artistic. So most people will say, oh, I'm not creative. I can't paint or I can't dance or sing. And um, the, the funny thing about creativity is it doesn't have to be artistic. and what I love about creativity is everybody's doing it every day. So people who say they're not creative are doing creative things. They just don't call it creativity. Like a pivot table is creative or, um, you know, choosing a new way to work or making a meal. Those are all examples of everyday creativity and we do it at work all day long. Very cool. I, I hadn't thought of creative pivot tables before that, that uh, I've know some uh, Excel masters that, are amazing in what they do. So yeah, that's, that's a great thought, but yeah, overcoming that perception is very challenging. So what are some of the barriers that you see when you're meeting with, you know, corporate executives or, you know, team leads and things like that in companies? What, uh, what have you faced in that area? It's funny because something like 92% of companies have innovation as a core value or believe in the value of innovation. But I think what, companies and and individuals are struggling with is how to create the conditions for individual creativity. So, you know, I say innovation starts with I, it's so much easier to spend. And the bulk of the time we spend in innovation is on the execution and the supply chain and the, you know, sourcement and procurement. But that little slice, that couple of percentage of the creativity part is where we often fall flat because it's completely counterintuitive to the whole idea of productivity. So if we're used to like spending 90% of our time in productivity and ROI and, and um, you know, metrics and KPIs, it can be difficult to switch out of that mode and get into a creative mode. And I think people think they're doing it, but they're not getting through that kind of barrier, like you said, and getting through to the really true innovation and the really truly good ideas because they're kind of stopping at that first incrementally improvement area, but not into the disruptive innovation area. Okay. And we'll, we'll talk in a little bit about some of the things that people can do uh, to, or like people and companies can do in the corporate world to improve creativity. But what, in terms of business, what does it mean for business when people are more creative? Oh, Tim, there's so much. It's, the rabbit hole I went down and it was like fireworks going off in the rabbit hole for me because there's because I'm very evidence based. You know, my background, as you know, is a veterinarian. So I I believe that it's important to you know have data and evidence. And there's so much evidence showing that on an individual level, if we exercise our everyday creativity, which is basically the bulk of what I speak about, 
we have a better mood the next day. There's research in nurses, family caregivers, engineers, a variety of different people that show when we use our creativity every day, we're happier. And what else happens at work is it increases our job um, performance up to 30% in some studies, our job satisfaction, um, improves team cohesion, and especially with this, what do they call it, the great resignation? You, you know, everybody's talking about that. It, it's, and if an employee identifies themselves as being creative, they're half as likely to be looking for a different job. So from a corporate oh, standpoint, it's, it's to me, the secret sauce for retaining employees and engagement. Yeah, absolutely. And a lot of people would think that, you know, it seems weird to have someone who talks about creativity on the Working Well podcast because we tend to be more business focused and about well-being of people, but well-being and creativity go hand in hand. Mm-hmm. And so can you talk a little bit more about the, the health and the happiness aspect of employees that are, that are in creative fields or that see themselves as creative or that have an expression for their creativity? Yeah, and I think that's the key, Tim, is the expression of creativity, because you could be in a very traditionally non-creative role, like an accountant building a pivot table, or if you're in a meeting where you feel like your voice is heard and you're contributing to like the workflow of the break room hygiene or something like that, even, you know, those are all examples of using our creativity. And in the workplace specifically, one of my favorite studies, actually, and I interviewed her a few weeks ago, is uh, a Karen Fuster out of Australia I did work around um, a, a dimension called tolerance of ambiguity. And that is how well are we, how comfortable are we when things are ambiguous and we don't know the answer? The answer is most people are not good <laughs> in, the, in the ambiguity. But I bring that up because in her research and other research, it correlates tolerance of ambiguity as as a kind of a dimension, which is partially based on personality genetics, but it's also influenceable. Is that a word? Influenceable? You can it influence. works for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm creative. I'm creating my own vocabulary. Exactly. Exactly. So we'll add it to the urban dictionary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> It'll be the new word for 2022. Um, so there's tolerance of ambiguity, there's creativity, and then there's resilience. And all three of those dimensions are highly, highly correlated. So I haven't seen a study where the, they're causal because causation is correlation is not causation. But the idea is if you can influence one of those, can you influence one of the other ones? And if you think about it, creativity is having something in your brain and then trying to put it into the world. And it's the ultimate in facing ambiguity. You know, when you're making a meal or building a pivot table or um, creating a new product line, you don't know what it's going to look like until you actually do it. So that's facing uncertainty, facing potential failure. And then if it doesn't work, rebounding and starting again. So the actual act of exercising our creativity is a boot camp for resilience because we're learning how to step into that uncomfortable place of ambiguity and continue anyway, and despite the possibility of failure. So I think that's how it's correlated as far as resilience goes. Uh, when it comes to well being, some researchers, and I think a year or two ago, discovered that the reason we like exercising our creativity, the reason it feels good, is because it's problem solving. So as a species, we love to solve problems. Doing something creative is solving problems, and that's why it makes us happy. Absolutely. And there, um, on your website, I was checking it out. Do you, you had a great stat that creativity is projected to be the number three job skill required by employers, and that's in 2020. Yeah. And I should have picked that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you also said by 2030, 85% of jobs have not yet been invented. That's right. So yeah. what, like, how does creativity fit into that? Yeah, and it depends on which um, source you're looking at and which year. So LinkedIn had creativity last year as number one skill. World Economic Forum um, is calling it uh, one of the number ones. It, it's funny because a lot of times they have it as creativity, but sometimes it's under problem solving, like problem solving will be number three. And then we have like, um, you know, innovation, like they're all kind of mixed in together, but definitely it's been the number one skill in LinkedIn in 2020, Bloomberg in 2019, you know, McKinsey, um, The Economist have all been touting the really important benefits of creativity to business. Yeah. And 
as like as you had mentioned in that stat, eighty five percent of jobs haven't been created. So there's massive room for disruption and creativity in designing the future. And companies that have people out there working on that and and thinking of new ideas and trying new things. And that doesn't happen unless you're exploring creativity in, in the business or, and facilitating it as a culture. Exactly. And I mean, you can look at the pandemic as an example. How many industries and jobs are there now that weren't around in February of 2020? Like, you know, uh, PEP or somewhat PPE, um, protective equipment, fogging, you know, travel thing. Like there's a huge industry now around um, something we didn't even know was going to exist in February of 2020, really. And uh, to your point that so many jobs haven't been created yet. And uh, RBC put out a future of skills work. And I believe that was even before the pandemic. And they said by 2025, uh, 85 million jobs will be deleted and it will be replaced with 97 million new jobs that we don't really even know what they're going to be yet. So as an, as an employer and executive, how do you, face that ambiguity and how do you use your creativity to make that an advantage as opposed to a liability? Yeah. And you said um, tolerance to ambiguity was a key factor in well-being, I guess you would say. How, how does how does all this fit together with some of these key hot buttons that are going on right now, stress and mental health? And you already mentioned the great resignation that is probably coming a bit later to Canada than it is the US. but but I can almost guarantee it is coming. Well, how do they all, um, so it was a question, how do they all relate together? Yeah, sorry. Uh, like how does that, we're facing a time of huge ang- a- ambiguity and that is a big stressor for a lot of people, but how does that impact with stress, mental health and all these changes we're seeing? And I guess how can companies harness that more effectively to improve their business and their odds of success in, in this type of environment. Yeah. I think the one of the first things, which is the hardest thing to do is not to react. So neurologically, when we're faced with ambiguity and we feel uncertain, we react with status quo solutions, you know, something that's worked for thousands of years to keep us alive. It's probably instinctively going to work, but not anymore. And not in a business context. So that's where tolerance of ambiguity comes in and it uses mindfulness techniques, which is also great for men. They're also interconnected, Tim. It's like a big tangle of yarn. So if you're mindful, you can say, it's okay, I'm in ambiguity now. I recognize I'm feeling uncertain, but I don't need to rush to a solution. And then assigning the amount of time you need to um, you know, start creating and using a process, maybe like design thinking or creative problem solving to actually take a problem through instead of just reacting. So I think that is one of the first things for everybody to do when we feel uncertain, because how many times have you seen people just trying to shove their regular in-office techniques onto Zoom? Right? They're like, yeah, all the time. <laughs> so this is what we did in office. We'll just do it where everybody's at home. Like that doesn't have to be that way, right? So if you take the problem of, you know, how do we get our work done when we're not in the office, that's a totally different question than how do we recreate our office virtually? Yeah. So I think asking the right questions and taking the time to find the right question is a really important uh, part of it. Yeah. I had a great conversation with a friend of mine who works at a pretty uh, traditional old school company. And it was, he's like, command and control leadership does not work in a virtual world when you can't see everyone at your desks and they're man- trying to mandate people back to the office and they were, they were back in the office back in like May or something <laughs> because the leadership is stuck in that mindset and thinks people were slacking. And, and so there's so much of that and not being able to think in a different way about how is this, how can this be a benefit to us and how can we adapt and grow and evolve? And I guess in a way that's leadership creativity, would you say? Yes, definitely. I think when you're talking about an organization that's like that with a traditional, you know, top down uh, approach, those are probably people who are not tolerant to ambiguity and aren't recognizing that the response to ambiguity is to force status quo solutions. 
And I think that that's a deficiency because if you want to keep up with the pace of how things are changing, it's not going to work. But just because it's worked for you for 20 years doesn't mean it's what, what worked for us yesterday might not even work for us tomorrow in this environment. So being able to be, I think a lot of that when you talk about leadership, being creative and leadership is a vulnerability. It takes a great amount of vulnerability to be curious and to be creative because you have to say, I don't know the answer. How are we going to find the answer? And so for a leadership style, it's very authoritarian and very, you know, traditional. It's going to be very difficult for them to move into a space where they're asking questions about creativity because they just want to hammer that nail in harder, right? Yeah. And so that that brings us to a great transition, I guess, to what can companies do to foster creativity, especially if leadership is... If, if there's an executive or a leader watching this now and they're probably starting to notice a few things like, oh, yeah, maybe I haven't been fostering creativity. How can they start to do that in their organization? Yeah, and I know business leaders really like to see that things have been looked at from um, you know a strategic and business perspective. So one of the studies I like the best is one done by Gallup. It's fairly recently, and they found that there are three main criteria that leaders and companies could use to encourage creativity at work. Number one, the expectation to be creative at work. Number two, the time to be creative, which is huge. And the third one is freedom to take risks. So when you talk about being expected to be creative, the time and the freedom to take risks, a lot of that is very um, intertwined with psychological safety. So if you're in in an unsafe environment, you're not going to take any risks, right? So um, I think Freedom to take risks, I mean, that seems so simple. Oh, just let people take risks. But I mean, psychological safety is one of the biggest puzzles we're trying to figure out. I think companies are really trying to figure out how to nail that piece. And if you can do that, I think creativity will naturally come, especially if you give those other incentives of an expectation to be creative. Like I expect you to come to meetings and expect to come to me with um, you know, ideas and solutions. And if all three are present, it also increases employee engagement. Seven out of 10 power employees feel empowered to innovate if those conditions are present versus two out of 10 if those conditions are not present. Absolutely. I saw that uh, stat that you had, I think you had said it in one of your presentations and I was like, wow, that's huge. Yeah. And you, uh, you said uh, there was another one I read 80, 88% of Gen Z believe that creativity will be essential to their success. And was it like 18% of employees only, only they can feel. Only eighteen percent of people feel they can take risks to be creative, and yeah, if creativity is the skill that is going to help us evolve and grow and solve problems beyond where we are now, yet there people aren't feeling safe, and that leads to poor well-being, higher stress levels, poor productivity, and more of the same <laughs> that we've been getting. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Like I do stand up comedy for fun. (laughs) And one of the hardest things is stepping out onto a virtual or figurative stage and share your creative, deep ideas with the world. Because not only do you have to get past your internal judgment of this thing is stupid, you have to worry about external judgment. And the first one is hard enough. But if you're in an environment where you know, it's been the, the, the first three comedians got up and got tomatoes thrown at them and criticized and booed off the stage. You're not going to share your ideas and you're going to start just punching that card and just doing what you need to do to get through the day. And, and then you'll leave like nobody wants to or should want to live like that. You know, we should want to go to work and feel like we're contributing. We should be able to go to work and feel like our ideas matter. And even if our idea is a bad idea, it's welcomed because the bad ideas are often what you know build to the good ideas. So we need those bad ideas. You want bad ideas because they can they, they're the ones that develop the truly disruptive ones. Well, and you make a great point too. If uh, if people don't feel safe to take those risks, they're not going to put it out there. And as leaders, we need to realize, and we might realize that we don't have all the answers, but we need to help other people know that we're comfortable not having all the answers. And I can't remember the exact stat, but it's like no no decision will ever have all the answers. 
So part of being a leader is being able to make decisions based on the best available information and being okay with the ambiguity that you don't have all the answers and you just have to make the best decision in the moment for that. And when people are, when employees are comfortable with you in, stepping into that mm -hmm. space and that comes across in spades and you mentioned psychological safety is that becomes the outcome. People start to open up and provide those ideas. And what's the a, a mentor of mine said, you have to be comfortable being bad at something in order to be good at something <laughs> down the road because you're never going to be great at something right away. So yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing for leaders to get over is to step into, you know what, I'm going to, when I open up and we do this creativity thing, we're going to get lots of terrible ideas and that's okay. That's in fact a prerequisite for getting good ideas. Yeah. yeah it's so true. And I think so many people, especially if they've reached the executive level or the professionals, they're not used to doing something badly. You've spent, you know, potentially 10, 20, 30 years building your craft and it's very uncomfortable to try something new. And I love to say it's very liberating to be bad at something on purpose and not care. And that's where creativity, like more traditional creativity is great. Like if you paint something and it's the ugliest thing in the world, you could just laugh and be like, look how bad that is. But, you know, you learn how to do it better the next time. And you learn that skill of stepping into uncertainty and facing failure. And Tim, you're exactly right. I think about leaders who try to look like they have it all together. You know, they don't they don't really model a, a safe environment. They have to sh model that and do it themselves that we're going to do things with the best knowledge that we have now. And I think some people get really nervous about that and nervous about creativity because it feels like chaos and it feels too random. Um, one of the things I've heard that really resonated with me is I think it was Teresa Amabiel, who is like one of the foremost creativity at work researchers. Her work is phenomenal. She talked about you're not teaching, you're not telling your team which mountain to climb. No, you're not letting them climb any mountain. I'm probably paraphrasing this wrong, but the idea is you're not telling them they can climb any mountain. You're telling them which mountain to climb, but you're letting them climb it in the way that they want to. And that ownership and that autonomy over how to get there is exercising creativity and it builds psychological safety. So it's not just like everybody climb all these random mountains. It's like, no, this is our mountain. So let's figure out how to get there together. Yeah. And that comes back a bit to uh, where we're seeing a ton of this, the challenges around leadership right now with the pandemic and authenticity has been a really big one. Uh, whether it's just the type of communications that are going out mm -hmm. and helping people really just see you know what? Yeah, the leaders might not have it all figured out, but they're being genuine with us. And on the flip side, other people just standing up there and yeah, yes, we've got it all covered. And meanwhile, everyone's looking around going, it's chaos around here. There's no way you have it covered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and then and, if they're lying about that or they're so deluded about that, what else are they deluded about and what kind of leader are they? Right. So I think it ends up being this counterintuitive effect. We have to look like we know what's going on. But everybody can see right through that. It's quite clear you don't know what's going on. And then it makes you seem actually less of a leader in some ways, I think, if, if you project that image. Um, for creativity and leadership, one of the best books is um, Creative Change by Jennifer Mueller. And she talks about leadership. And she talks about how we promote leaders that look a certain way. Not because that's effective leadership, but because that's what we expect leaders to look like. So we're like, we're used to seeing leaders looking, you know, confident and have it all together. So therefore, those are good leadership traits. It's an unconscious bias. And the question is, how do we change that bias around a false idea of what leadership looks like? Because people who become leaders maybe know and intend to be like that, but we tend to do what we think is the right thing. I think everybody, leaders to frontline employees, we all try to put this box around ourselves that meets the image of what we think people expect us to be. And I think to your point about more authentic leadership and more authenticity is maybe not breaking the box altogether because, you know, there's certain like, you know, guidelines that we work around, but maybe like decorate your box a little bit, you know, like have a little bit more fun with it and try to be, because that's how you come up with different ideas. If we have a bunch of cardboard boxes in a room, no one's going to come up with a good idea. 
you need diversity, you need different experiences, you need deep differences in worldviews to get really creative ideas. So um, I think all of those points to leadership about trying to be this visit, this mask of what people are expecting you to be is something we need to get rid of altogether. That's a great point is one of the reasons strategic meetings often happen offsite. It's like you put you literally put yourself in a different environment because it changes your thought processes. Um, and be like walking around the block when you're having a meeting, the physical movement changes how your, how your brain thinks and you will be more creative. Like I routinely, when I'm out for bike rides or out, uh, doing a workout outside, I, I, all these things pop into my head and I sometimes like sit down and I like dictate a note into my phone because I'm like, Oh, that's fantastic. Yet when you're sitting at your desk, staring at a screen, you don't get that idea. Yeah. Why people get inspiration in the shower. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And you know, those are great examples, Tim. I'm the same way. And I do the, the dictation too. You'll see comedians will carry a notebook around with them to like write down observations. And part of that is because we're keeping our thinking analytical brain that's often stopping us from being creative. We're giving it something to do, but not so much to do that all our focus is on it, but like going for a walk and moving your body, um, getting different environmental things in the shower, you're, you know, you have a task to do or driving. Some people say driving is another one. So we're using our brain to kind of occupy that task, but it's not taking over completely, it's just kind of distracting it. And that allows our default mode network, which is the nerdy day way to say when you're daydreaming, when the connections are happening in your brain. And uh, we don't know it's happening. So people think it's not working. You think I'm being lazy or I'm not doing anything. But that's when those ideas are germinating, like when you go on your bike ride. And that's when things are happening in your brain that you don't even recognize or they're not even conscious. But they, you know, pop an idea. It's like when people say they go to bed thinking about a problem, they wake up and poof, the answer is there the, the next day. I mean, it's not magic. It's your brain, like ping-ponging it around inside your head to try to find a connection or an idea that works. Yeah. And you're not sitting there like, okay, I need to really think of this creative idea because that just yes. wrecks the whole process. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, there's, there's two kinds of thinking. There's divergent and convergent in creative thinking. And so divergent is the daydreaming and the how could, you know, what sky's the limit. Convergent is that more like rigorous, you know, what is the right answer here? And both of them are part of creativity. They're both very important but people try to do them at the same time. So they try to diverge and converge like, oh, that's a bad idea. And what we need to do is um, separate them. So you need to diverge and really allow yourself to diverge. No bad answer, no bad idea, sky's the limit. And then once you've done that, then you can converge and say, okay, what are the most likely ideas to be feasible? How can we move forward with whichever idea? And that is one of the key tricks to being creative anywhere, whether it's a home or in the workplace, is don't try to edit your ideas as you're creating them. I mean, you've written a book. A lot of people say that with books. You know, it's that that um, crappy first draft, right? So just it's write. a prerequisite to a better second draft. Exactly. So yeah. you're not supposed to edit your book as you write it. You're just supposed to barf it out and then go back and edit it. Yeah. And so I, I love those thoughts and ideas and, and we probably, I'd say most people are pretty familiar with those things that from various aspects of their life, but from a leaders and executive standpoint, how do we pull that together and say, okay, if we want to introduce creativity to our team and improve innovation or employee well-being, what does that look like in a typical corporate environment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question because Practically speaking, how do you do that? And I think I would go back to that Gallup study. So number one, an expectation to be creative. Um, I spoke to um, a business owner who says he starts at the interview process, like even when they apply, you know, they say well, you're expected to be creative and share your ideas. So I think having that as um, a, a corporate, like a part of your culture, a part of, you know, what your values are as a company is important. Giving the time to be creative. And that is a really sticky one. So how do you assign time for creativity? especially when uh, people have different ways they engage their creativity. Some seven out of 10 people in um, an Adobe study prefer to be creative alone, which is completely opposite to a typical brainstorming session, right? So how do we um, honor everybody's individual need for how they express their creativity and give time without feeling like wasting time? So 
one of the things I like to talk about is in defense of daydreaming, right? I go into companies and I talk about the benefits of daydreaming and I'm like, I'm, I'm worried I'm going to get daggers shot at me through eyes from leadership. Like you can't tell our employees to daydream. But if you want better ideas, you that you know some of the opposite things to traditional productivity is something we need to embrace. So I yeah. think for a company that's not doing anything, I think um, starting small with just the expectation to be creative and it comes from leadership, like we talked about earlier, modeling the behavior of let's try something. You know, what are the risks? Let's mitigate the risks. Like let's not completely change everything on its head. But how can we make a small incremental change? And do something that is not going to, you know, fold the company, but is a bit of a risk that we can learn from. And, um, and those are some ideas anyway. Well, and, and one of the things I love about your approach and is that you say, hey, like, this doesn't mean you have to, like, do a, a team building session where you ping, finger paint and things like that. And, like, <laughs> you can just see all the tradition, like, you know, going to a law firm or something and people are like, oh, come on. It's like there's so much of that out there as people have this mindset of creativity. It's like, Oh, I need to be doodling or I need to be finger painting or I need to be, you know, a musician or something. And it's really unique to each person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very true, Tim. And sorry. I was going to say, yeah, on that note, how, how, like, how do you talk to leaders and executives to help them really understand that more fully? Yeah, I think, I go back to this idea of, um, for me, it's a practice and it feels the same. So facing ambiguity and uncertainty is really what leaders are struggling with a lot these days. And they're not getting people to come along with change or they're struggling themselves with change. So part of it is an awareness around um, when we're feeling uncertain. They've done research to show that people who are exposed to like playing cards that have the wrong color, so like with hearts or black, in some okay. cases. So they just like flash these car- these card decks at people and one group had normal cards and the other group had some of these cards that had the wrong color. And the important part is nobody recognized and nobody noticed that the colors were wrong. And they had asked them, all of them about affirmative action. This is probably about a 15 year old study. And then they did this um, with the two different groups and the group that saw the cards with the wrong colors were much less likely to consider another person's point of view they were much more rigid in their stance and they were much less willing to consider another point of view with affirmative action. So the point being that when we're feeling uncertain, even if we don't recognize we're feeling uncertain, it affects our judgment and our decisions. So if I were to say one thing to your question about, about leadership is to try to get into this space of where you're facing uncertainty and you recognize how that feels, you know, to your work, working with um, a lot of physical movement and going for walks, when I'm like at the top of a ski run and it's a little harder than I'm used to, or when I'm, my name's called to go on stage for stand up, or I'm picking up the phone to make a difficult conversation, but I have the same physical sensations. You know, for me, it's like I feel like I'm bouncing on my feet a little bit. I kind of feel like I want to shake my hands. I get like a tension in my face. And so if I'm, if I'm able to catch myself with that feeling, I can say, oh, wait, wait a second, like something's making me feel uncertain here. And then I can, become more mindful and think I am right here in this moment. Like, I don't need to worry about, you know, next quarter's returns. I don't need to worry about like what that employee is going to do. I just need to like sit in this space of being uncertain right now. And I think if that practice is the one thing people can do, I think they'll make better decisions and they'll be able to take a step back and, and consider the options and be more creative in their options rather than jumping to those status quo solutions that they've always done. Yeah. Well, I guess there's the good news is there's lots of practice about uncertainty right now. <laughs> That's so true. Change is happening so fast and people are like, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like or next week. And but, give yourself some slack too, because I mean, it's, it's stressful. Like you had said, you know, people are, are tired and it's very tiring um, being in uncertainty all the time. So I think also giving ourselves a little bit of grace and not expecting that we're going to be doing the exact same things in this in this environment, they would have been a more stable environment. I think sometimes self-acceptance comes along with that vulnerability of leadership and, and psychological safety. Awesome. Yeah. And I think one, one of the other myths around creativity is it's, people think it's like willpower, that it's a finite resource. Mm-hmm. Uh, how, what can you speak to on that? 
You mean like if I if I'm creative for an hour, then I have no more creativity that day? Is that what you mean? Or yeah, like it's like oh, it's a I I might use it up or I don't have much of it to begin with, and so oh. <laughs> like oh no, I mean that's the more you are creative, the more you become creative because it's like a, a muscle you use. You know, you learn to stop that inner critic. You learn to. Um, it's practice. You know, the people who speak out in meetings, the people who share their ideas that you think, wow, they're bold. Like they didn't just become that way. Like they've done that over practice and realizing that if they shared this little idea, oh, they didn't get fired and nobody hated them. So next time I'll try a bigger idea. It's all practice. So uh, I think number one, everybody is creative. It's a biological fact. Like it's a neuroscientific fact. It's like breathing. So that's how I like to compare it. So you know, Tim, you probably talk about different breathing techniques like box breathing and, you know, ways to manage um, anxiety with the breathing technique. So creativity is the same way. You already have creativity, just like you already know how to breathe. But there's environments that can help promote your creativity and let you express your own creativity more fully and completely. And I think the number one barrier is usually fear of judgment of, from yourself or from other people. Yeah, going back to that Gallup study, the expectation to be creative. So if someone's in a, call it non or a traditional environment where there's an expectation that you're not going to be creative mm -hmm. and people, someone feels that they're not able to express themselves in that way, what are some things they can do there? And they don't feel they're free to take risks. Yeah, quit, quit. <laughs> you mean it, like if you're the employee and your, your managers aren't really promoting this idea of being creative? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I think for people who are concerned about creativity, some of that is I in my this is all from my opinion, not from any data, but I feel like if that's the case, you kind of need to ask forgiveness before you ask permission. So I think that if you try some things, and then you show, you know, that that in many cases, there's a positive return, and it might be a tiny incremental thing that is different, but still within the framework of the expected norms of the company then I think that that can really help because then the thing is creativity is contagious. You know, when I opened a jewelry business, I was nervous to tell my vet colleagues because I thought, I thought they would think it was weird. And some of them did, but most people would come back to me a few months later and say, you know, I thought it was kind of cool. You did that. I thought it was weird, but I thought it was kind of cool. You did that jewelry business. And so then I did that thing I haven't done for years. You know, it really, it, it really becomes contagious. So if you have somebody who's feeling like they want to make small creative changes, it will naturally motivate other people to do the same. Absolutely. Yeah. Like you said, the, the freedom to take risks. If, if someone's fearing taking, taking a risk, just doing it will help them realize that that fear is probably not as warranted. And if they do get fired for taking a small risk, then it probably wasn't the right situation anyway. <laughs> That's so true. And, you know, it reminds me of a situation, like sometimes it's helpful to be clueless. So in one of my, like my very first kind of corporate job, um, we were doing a presentation and it was a very, um, very important client, a large group of people. And I was doing, I suggested doing something a little bit different. We did this kind of choose your own adventure kind of thing. It was really fun. I was excited to do it, but I was kind of clueless. And one of my co-presenters at the beginning was super nervous. And he said, what if what we're presenting doesn't align with what they want to do as a company. And, you know, the cluelessness in me, which is also sometimes helpful for creativity. If you've ever met a kindergartner, you know, that's why they're creatives because they're clueless. I was like, oh, it never really occurred to me. I was just like, let's do something fun that, you know, is important for the strategy that will help give them the information they need to use. Our like I, there were reasons and strategies behind it, but the thought that, you know, it would go counter to what like I hadn't even considered that. So it was kind of nice to be clueless. So sometimes, you know, feigning ignorance is a good strategy with creativity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and, and on the one thing you had alluded to on that Gallup study was the time to be creative and that most companies don't allocate time for employees to whether it's daydreaming or mm -hmm. uh, I think the most, at least for me, the most common example of that is Google's 20% uh, time or whatever, 10% time. I can't remember. I think, of, I think it's 20%, yeah. whereas one day of the week, they people can work on whatever they want to work on, yeah. whether it's a hobby, a charity, some piece of coding that they wanted to do. And you know, I think that's a pretty extreme example for um, in, in a more traditional company, but 
you know, one day a month or an afternoon a month to work on something like that might be a place to start. Yeah. And it doesn't even have to be, like you said, Google and 3M was another one that was famous, famous for innovation that used to do that, um, allow people to work on projects. But I think a lot of it, and you go back to like when Steve Jobs um, opened, like managed Pixar, he only had one washroom in the middle of the building. So everybody had to use the same washroom. And so I think um, one of the key drivers of creativity is cross-functional collaboration. And we're seeing that in the global push towards open talent and open innovation, where companies will find somebody with a very specific niche expertise in something and just hire them for like a very short amount of time. Or they'll put out a bid for like, we want to know the best way to like keep hamburgers warm. And then companies will like compete and then whoever wins gets, you know, a large amount, a large prize. So um, when I'm going with that, and also there's companies where experts like a Google or a different company can go and be um, guests in classrooms and they can share their expertise. So I think that there would be definitely a place to improve, increase this cross-functional collaboration by allowing employees a small amount, whatever you know you can start with as a company, but to try to get them even doing like different things with different um, different groups or universities or try to use their expertise to share with other people and vice versa. Um, I interviewed a fellow um, who works at NASA and he was saying this company for years and years and years couldn't figure out this one little piece. It was some biomedical uh, company and they put out one of these open talent calls and two people separately that didn't know each other had the solution that they've been working on for years and years and years. So I think to think that our company has all the expertise as technology advances so rapidly is 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 not is not sustainable like we have to know that we can share our expertise but also then get it from other people and be a little bit more um wide in our net for searching for the answers yeah and would you say the the work from home situation the remote work has hindered or fostered creativity oh that's a good that's a good question jim i haven't had anyone ask me that question before one of the, um, when they talk about how do you make your space creative, one of the things is if you personalize your workstation, it can increase your creativity by 20 or 30%. So what's more personal than your home? So I think from that standpoint, definitely it would improve creativity. I think the challenge is, I was listening to one of your podcasts with Michelle Berg and how she was saying that during the pandemic, there's so many more meetings because people are home. And I think that would be a hindrance to creativity because we don't have that time that we're walking to, you know, the coffee shop or where we're going, going to the bathroom and we just run into somebody to chat. Um, you know, for the people I think who are taking walks and taking those breaks, if that happens, maybe it would be more conducive. So I think it probably really depends on the individual and how they're managing their time at home and probably what other commitments they have, whether it be like care, caregivers um, or, you know, other responsibilities that they have to do. What do you and think, Kim? Well, I, I was going to say too, there, there's arguments on both sides. Like a lot of people say the water cooler talk that that just um, impromptu connections with coworkers doesn't happen as much in the remote mm-hmm. side. But then on the flip side, you had mentioned cross, cross-functional collaboration. I think there are many more opportunities now in a, to just have a couple people pop onto a meeting that might not normally attend a meeting because maybe they're in a different building or a different country, even um, different city, if you're a large organization. And so these are things that can easily be incorporated to add new perspectives um, as, as the, well, we, we also get, there's been a lot of commentary about um, seeing people's homes and the, uh, so you get especially uh, cultural differences and that might be downplayed in the office, mm-hmm. but now you're on Zoom and you're seeing into people's homes. And so you get a different perspective mm-hmm. and you're able to embrace that they're living from a different perspective and, and they have different ideas. So you might be more open to that. Yeah, that's a great point about the cultural differences, because that's one of the key drivers of creativity. And so if you show up at work trying to be in that box, people don't, rec- you know, maybe you don't share, you know, the different cultural things that you do or different practices. And now that we're virtual, people are seeing that and you don't have a choice but to share it. And then you're potentially failing, but you realize 
you're not failing and people are interested and they're you know connecting on things that they wouldn't otherwise connect on whereas at the water pool everyone's in their suit and like in work mode right so i think that's a really good point and that would be a really strong drive for creativity for sure very cool so if you had to sum it up what what would you say are the top two or three things that companies can do to really put themselves on a more creative trajectory and you know go back to the Gallup things mm-hmm. expectation how how do we how do we set that expectation yeah, where does it happen it, yeah i think it happens ideally from the beginning from the from the job ad to the interview to all the way through management and and the vision and values of a company which I, I get is not like a quick fix for a lot of things. Sure it is. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's hard. And I think, um, you know, like you had said before about it has to come from the leaders and they have to model it. So if my manager is being told you need to help people be creative and give them expectations to be creative and freedom to take risks. But if you don't do it right, then, you know, you're not going to get your bonus or, you know, the, so that, that I mean, that's not going to work. So it has to start, I think, at the top in the modeling for people to say, oh, I guess it's OK for me to um, to do that because the leader did that and it was OK. And they're showing us and that, com- that comes with vulnerability because, you know, you're in that expression with uh, kids don't do what you say, they do what you do. So I feel like it's kind of like that, like you yeah. can't have a leader saying you can fail and take risks. But then, you know, they're like, absolutely, we cannot have this, whatever, you know, like you have to be vulnerable yourself and say, you know, look what I did, you know, not to share your deepest, darkest secrets, but for a leader to say, you know, we tried something, we thought it would work, it didn't really work, you know, that's okay, we're going to change. Here's what we learned from it. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. it's like, you can only make mistakes that turn out well in the end. (laughs) But there's a word for that, where you judge your... Do you judge your decision by the outcome, not by what you had said before, what you knew at the time? We tend to judge our decision by what we know now versus what we actually knew when we made the decision. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember where I heard that. Yeah, that's that's a good point to remember. Yeah. I'm probably paraphrasing it wrong. I don't remember. <laughs> I'm, I'm notorious for that. It's like, I heard this somewhere. I think it was like this and it doesn't... Or I feel like it's crazy because I'll say something like uh, the last person and the, the last worm laughs last or something. And they're like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> like, I guess it does. The early bird gets the worm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Something I'll, I'll mix my uh, idioms and they'll be like, that doesn't even make sense. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been awesome. I've loved hearing about all the different outlets and avenues for being creative, but also how companies can can implement it. Where can people find out more about the creativity, the sessions you speak on? Uh, you have a book coming out. Like, where can we find out about all this? Yeah, thanks, Timmy. I am writing a book, A Big Creative Adventure in Facing Ambiguity. Um, the book is called The Reluctant Creative, uh, Five Effortless Habits to uh, Expand Your Comfort Zone. So um, that's coming out hopefully in December and information will be, I'm on LinkedIn. Also, I've got a website, carolinebrookfield.com. And I would love to leave with this idea and this challenge to companies to say, you know, up to 80% of people are talking about leaving their jobs this year and creative employees are half as likely to be leaving their job. And only 18% of people, like you said, feel like they can take the risk to be creative at work. And to me, that is the low hanging fruit for the next five to 10 years is finding that magical way to help employees feel safe and creative. And as a byproduct, you'll get better well-being and resilience. And but it it feels risky. So, you know, I I really appreciate the time to have this amazing conversation with you, Tim, hear your perspectives on creativity and hope to find it helpful for your audience. Absolutely. Thank you. And going back again to what we said at the beginning, the embracing the definition of creativity not no finger painting involved no finger painting no macrame yeah you can you can do it in excel (laughs) exactly no uh uh, scenes from ghost with the the clay (laughs) no pottery making yeah no not that those things are bad you can if that's your thing go for it but exactly but you don't have to even just cooking gardening you know, um, 
decorating, choosing your outfits, you know, going shopping for earrings. Like those are all things that are creative, even though it might not be you actually making them. You're putting them together and creating something from your imagination and from your heart, which I think is where it matters. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. And we will definitely be in touch and uh, I will make sure people have the connection to your website and thank you again for everything. We will see you very soon. Thanks, Tim. Thank you for listening to the Working Well podcast. If you enjoyed the show, don't forget to rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to hear your experiences and how you've applied tips from the show to your daily life. So please keep us posted on your progress. To stay up to date with new episode releases, make sure to subscribe to our mailing list by emailing podcast at freshgroup.ca and follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you everyone for tuning in. And once again, I'm Tim Boris with Fresh Wellness Group. We'll see you on the next episode.